Devil's Tower, Wyoming. That's the destination for our next episode of Painting and Travel. Sarah speaks with renowned rock climber Frank Sanders, while Roger sets up his easel and uses acrylics to paint the famous landmark. Welcome. If you've guessed that we're in Devil's Tower, Wyoming, you're right. And that's the very subject that Roger's going to paint. Later, I'm going to talk to Frank Sanders, who's an experienced rock climber. And his front yard here at the lodge looks right at Devil's Tower. Frank's going to tell us about what it feels like to climb Devil's Tower and to live near it and feel the the power, the peace, uh, the beauty of living near it? There is an inexplicable but undeniable power and peace that's with the tower. I was very attracted to come and see it. I, um, I think I first saw it in the movie Close Encounters and wondered if it was even a real place or if they just made it for the movie. Of course, obvious. I'm a rock climber and as far as places to climb go, this is an amazing place. How often do you get to the top? How many climbs over the years have you been able to accomplish? Well, I guess the best answer to that, Sarah, is not enough, because mm -hmm. I'm 61 and I keep doing it. And I've been to the top of the tower more than 2,000 times. Part of that's my guide service here. We're taking people up, oh, just about every day of the week. Can anybody try it, even people that haven't had experience? Anyone can come and learn to rock climb here. I've had the joy of escorting a seven-year-old a 73-year-old, a one-legged man, a one-armed man, and the one common ground there is desire. So do you see it in through new eyes every time you take up new people? I do. So you get to re-experience that thrill it's, of approaching? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. It's uh, that first thrill again and again and again. This crack jamming, crack climbing, it's a different language entirely. And what you're doing there is inserting your fingers or your hands in a wide spot in the crack and working it down to a narrow spot so the rock is holding on to you. You're not holding on to oh the rock. Oh my goodness, I had no idea that's what It's actually lazy. You're wedging lazy. It down in there. And You're a little not bit holding secure. On. There's some security Very in that. secure. I never knew that. Huh? Very secure. So you think of the crevice as sort of being a V-shape, and yes. you, you put your hand in there, and then you're coming down so that it would be hard to get your hand out. So. Almost impossible. You'd ask me earlier about um, how fast do people climb and, mm -hmm. and how many times in a day mm -hmm. it's been summited. Um, for the record, my guide Felipe has free soloed and the current record is about 11 and a half minutes. And I myself, um, quite unintentionally, it was just a day off and I wanted to go climb alone. But by the end of the day, I found that I had indeed touched the top of the tower 16 times. But generally, climbing is very meditative. It's, it's, it's a heightening of the senses and a sharpening of the focus. And how do the challenges change as the weather changes or the seasons change? Well, we're fortunate here. The tower is steep enough that the snow does not stick to the side. So even in the winter, it's pretty much snow free. There is no water source at the top of the tower. So there's no ice that forms. So climbing on the tower in the winter is a real joy. Now let's see your hands. I know people always talk about the hands being especially developed. 
No. They, they look like regular hands. I play piano. I've just got calluses in places that don't, you don't. Mm -hmm. And so these hands can carry you up and down 2,000 times here and many other places. And many other places, sir. Well, you really have a lovely spot here, and I imagine that um, everyone that comes here has probably changed a bit after having the pleasure of, of visiting here and, and developing a kind of a relationship with the mountain. Indeed. Um, the tower is sacred to 18 different tribes that have lived in this area over time. And uh, I don't think the sacred nature is limited to the Native Americans. We see people come here inexplicably, but undeniably every year. Some come intentionally, knowing that they are seeking an emotional or spiritual or physical healing. Others come unconsciously, also needing a physical or spiritual or emotional healing. I don't think the towers let anybody down yet. Well, it certainly hasn't let us down. It's just been great being here. And thanks so much for taking time out from your guiding duties to talk to me. I really enjoyed it very much. And uh, I hope to come back sometime and uh, be led on, a, on an official rock climbing expedition. I'll be using an 11 by 14 inch piece of masonite today covered with gesso and my palette consists of titanium white, ultramarine blue, cerulean blue, Indian yellow, and three earth colors, yellow ochre, burnt sienna, and burnt umber. I also have a very opaque green called chromium oxide green. I often tone my board to begin with, but this morning I'm not going to do this because there are particular textures up there that I want to achieve. And if I were to tone this board to begin with, I might not be able to, to get those textures that I'm looking for in that mountain. There's no real need to draw this with a pencil or charcoal. These are pretty big basic shapes here. So I think I'll just draw it with my brush. And for my brushes, I just have three small flats. Later on I may use a pointed brush for some detail, but just to lay this in, I just need this few large brushes. I did several paintings of this yesterday, one small watercolor and one acrylic, and I did notice as the day went on, even just minute by minute, uh, the colors of this mountain changed drastically. And as you can see today, we have some overcast right up there. Now, as soon as that breaks, this mountain is going to change color. So that's always a problem and an issue when painting on location like this. I don't, really don't know what the answer is. When the color changes, the whole flavor of the scene changes. Here with acrylics, I can just Change this as I go here quickly. I don't want too much sky in there because I'm not painting the sky. This is not a painting about the sky. So I think I'll keep Devil's Tower pushed up here right at the very top. I have to keep in mind I don't want this right in the center of the painting either. So it might be best just to move this over just slightly here. This is a beautiful, nice, hard tree line right here. Those are all pine trees up there. And then we have this cliff area right down in here. Have this big red area right in here. That big red area. What I'm trying to do now is look at the mountain and look at what I think might be a local color, which there really isn't one color there. There's so many colors there, but in order to start, wow, here comes that sun. See, everything's gonna change. But I'm going to try and mix sort of a, a grayish green to start as a base coat for this mountain. I have a little spray atomizer here. This is very helpful. It will keep my 
my board a little bit wet, my paint's slightly wet as I work. Here's this field right underneath. Wow, look how that light is just blasting on the top of the tower there. Sometimes that tower looks green, sometimes it looks orange. It, it just changes all different colors during the day. We just basically have to pick one color and, and stay with it. I generally like to start with my dark colors. So I'm going to place in these, this tree line here first. You have a large stand of trees coming down here on the right. I'm making this more gray than I would normally, I think. This isn't really a green color, it's sort of a, a brownish color, but we'll start with this and then I'll lay those greens on top of it. As you can see over to our left, there's a large stand of trees coming in here and I'm going to put a few of those up in this area just so everything isn't in the distance or middle ground. I always, if I can, I always like to have something in the foreground. And of course this will be in the foreground, but I like to have something of more substance in the foreground. So I'm going to add some of these trees over here that I see to my left. I can't believe how uh, damp and wet it is and how different it is working out here in such a, a damp condition. It's almost uh, like the difference of working with watercolors or oils. I mean, it just feels totally different. I'm painting this rather thin to start with. As you can see, I'm not really using too many colors or too much palette space. It's all a bit monochromatic at this point. More paintings are ruined by just using too much color. Although there's a lot of color up here, there is also a lot of subtle colors and grays. And I want to start with those and reserve some of the brighter colors for uh, towards the end of the painting that I can use as accents. We have a brilliant blue sky this morning, but I think I'll add that sky later because right now I'll work on Devil's Tower here and try and get some of that form and texture and then I'll paint the sky around it. I'm going to apply this rather thin and then just work into my heavier colors as I go and as this dries. Yesterday, Sarah and I walked around the base of the mountain and we saw climbers climbing up the mountain there. And from here, you couldn't even see them with the naked eye. They were, it's, it's so small and that is so large up there. And it was incredible just to sit there and watch both men and women scale that incredible thing. <laughs> well, since I have this color here, I think I'll put that same color right down here in the foreground. I'm using a little bit of Indian yellow now with uh, burnt sienna. Let's lay in this rusty color here. I like to keep my whole painting going at the same time, so I don't want to neglect any one area, although I am neglecting the sky for now. With this large brush, I'll take the yellow ochre, a bit of burnt sienna, and I'll keep building this up with different textures. One advantage of using the acrylics here is I can put on one color and then shortly I can go over it with another color. I like that idea because I can build up layer upon layer and not have to wait very long as I would if I were to use oils. Well, I have to take a moment here and study that tower. It seems to be darker on this side right now. This is where the sprayer comes in handy. I can touch that with some water. And now this paint that I put on here will flow over the dry paint much easier. Well, when you get close to the base of that tower, all these thin columns running down are, are just enormous. I'm going to use some white in here, Indian yellow, and maybe a touch of my uh, chromium oxide green. And I'll lightly drag some of these colors 
right down using these vertical strokes. Later we'll come back with a, a small brush and add some of the details. But a lot of detail can be made with a, a larger brush if it, if it has a good chisel point on it. I try and stay away from using the small brushes as much as I can because when you start to use a small brush you start to work on detail and then maybe ignore the big picture of the of the painting all the large shapes and without getting all these nice large shapes in here first uh, no amount of detail will will fix a painting without having this a good foundation of large broad shapes in here I'm going to mix my Indian yellow and ultramarine blue and get a nice dark green We'll start building up some of these trees in here. Now there's the trees in the foreground are going to be a little bit darker than those back there because there's some atmosphere between the trees in the foreground and the trees in the background. It's not that far away but in order to make the painting look, uh, give the painting some distance, uh, these trees right in the foreground here over here to my left will be slightly darker than any of the trees back in here. These trees right here, we won't use any white in them. And that means not using any colors with white in them. So Indian yellow and ultramarine blue, they're transparent colors, so that'll make a nice dark color. I don't want to bring this tree up very high because I don't want it to fight with the mountain here. Even now you can see this gives it a little bit better sense of distance with having this dark. This is a slightly lighter. These up here will be just a touch lighter again. It's most important to get the values right. If the colors are a bit off, that's okay. But the values need to be as accurate as possible. Here's some uh, opaque green here made with some white and some of the chromium oxide green, maybe a touch of yellow ochre. Now all these are opaque colors, so when I put them on, say right at the top of this ridge, it's going to, I'm not going to get any texture there since this is opaque. And that gives a little bit of eye relief to all the other texture. And I'll touch in a few negative areas in this tree right back here. Well, I think I'll add the sky now. <laughs> I'll take my white, uh, some cerulean blue, and a touch of yellow ochre. Now the reason I'm using the yellow ochre is I don't want to get the sky too blue because it will look foreign to the rest of the painting. Here we have all these greenish colors and if we had just a blue sky up here uh, without warming it up with some other color like this yellow ochre, uh, it would just, the, the harmony wouldn't be there. So I'm going to change the color of the sky to suit the painting. Right down here, towards the horizon, I'm going to make this even warmer. And I'll cut into some of my trees here. And the reason for making this sky warmer than just the blue as I see it, is that a painting, I think, has to have an overall color tone to it. So when, when I look at a painting, I like to be able to say this is a yellow painting or a blue painting or a bluish gray painting, something like that. It, although there's a lot of color variations going on within the painting, uh, you can always say what flavor the painting is or what general color it is. Yellow ochre, Indian yellow and some white. Now we'll start refining this. Now that I have all the big basic shapes covered, I have all my bases covered, so to speak, now I can start refining this and adding the, some of the detail. And I can also begin to lighten it up at this point because right now everything is probably somewhat darker than I wanted in the final painting. For instance, this area right here I'm working on. But since this was darker to begin with, I can add these lights over it and some of these dark colors will show through and express some of the texture of those rocks. And I want to try and vary my colors as I go. So here I'll go from a yellowish ochre color to a, a more warm burnt sienna color. 
I may be reading into these colors more than what I see, but I'm mostly concerned with the painting itself and how I hope it will look as, as a finished painting. I'm not trying to make any kind of a photographic statement here. Here with my Indian yellow and burnt sienna. We'll darken this up. Now I'm using this as a, as a glaze. So I'm using this thin, transparent colors here. You see, if I were to put this color right here over this dark color, it doesn't really show up much. It's because it's transparent. You can see right through it. Now if I were to add white or an opaque color to this, for instance, if I were to add, to add yellow ochre to this, see, that would cover it totally. But that's not what I wanted here. I wanted some transparent colors to build up those layers of texture. So I'm not using any opaque colors. I mean, some of them may be semi-opaque, but to get this texture that I want here, I'm going to just keep layering it with some transparent colors. Of course, here I used white because I wanted to lighten it up. See, I'm getting quite a bit of detail in there with this large brush. Don't need a small brush yet. It's a fascinating little undercut right up here. I can remove some of this paint to get a fresh start on my palette. And I just put it in a little box down here so as to not leave anything behind. Now I'm going to a smaller brush. It's still a bright. And I'll add a touch of white to that and put these trees back in up here. The reason I'm adding the white is because I don't want it to be as dark as these trees here in the foreground. I'll have to go back again and add some trees. And once again, it's a, a back and forth. Add some trees, add some of the grass, add some trees, just to keep building it up. With some sky color, which was the cerulean blue and yellow ochre, I'm going to try and match that. Doesn't have to be real close, but close enough. We'll mix that. Now we'll put in a few negative areas in these trees. With a wash of color, I'm going to take my Indian yellow, transparent color. Some Indian yellows aren't transparent, this one is. I'm going to add just a slight bit of color up here. Not much, just a little. And as I look at this, I see some very cool colors up there. Cerulean blue might work good as a wash. I'll spray this. And I'll just put some cool colors right on this side. I'll wipe my brush off and then I can just Blend these in there. If there's too much in there, I'll wipe my brush off and just pick them out. Now I have this bluish green plant down here. I love that color. And I'm going to use my chromium oxide green and cerulean blue to hopefully accomplish that color. And I'm looking at the plant. I'm looking at the color on my palette. And I'll just add a few of these in here. Kind of breaks up that solid color band across there as well. With a small brush, I'll touch in a few tree trunks here. I won't draw a tree trunk all the way from the base all the way to the top because that would look like a dead tree. So I'll just put in a branch here and a branch there because these branches lose themselves among the leaves. Well, so far I've managed to do this painting without using any small pointed brush, just these three brights. Sunlight is hitting Devil's Tower in a beautiful way right now. I'm going to try and capture that. Maybe yellow ochre. Just lighten this area. I'm still just using this small bright. Oh, that light's gone now. There are a couple of trees right up in here, too. Those trees are a nice touch because they tie this whole thing in, don't they? One more highlight right on the edge. I always see this one area of really light that's hitting the Devil's Tower. I could do more here in the field, but I think in order to bring it to completion, I'll take a few photographs. We'll go back to the studio and we'll finish it there. I'm back in the studio and here are a few things I did to complete this painting. 
I didn't like the color of this sky. Sometimes in the field, it's hard to know exactly what colors and values to use. And sometimes I can better figure that out here in the studio, especially since outside when everything is changing so fast, especially the sky. So I did make this sky a bit bluer and I did add some subtle clouds. And these clouds sort of point themselves to the tower, which is the center of interest. Very subtle, but I think it helped just a little bit. You can see the perspective here of these clouds heading in towards this area. I defined the shape of the tower a little more accurately. And there was a beautiful light at one point coming across the tower. So I tried to capture that here in the studio and added this warm yellowish color light coming over here. And then with some cerulean blue, I put a cooler color on this side. There were so many trees here at Devil's Tower. So I added a few more of those in these areas. I lightened the foreground slightly. And over here where this set of trees were, I added more trunks and branches. And to finish the painting, I put a bit of intense color right along the edge of these trees, right along their rim. Well, if you ever get a chance to go out to Devil's Tower, don't pass it up. It's a great place to visit, a wonderful place to paint. There's a squirrel. There's a squirrel. <laughs> Good. You missed him. Keep your eye on the road, Mickey. Keep eye on the road. <laughs> good, 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 good. Oh, you've got a heavy foot on the gas, don't you? Oh, that's my foot. There's a curve coming up. What do we do when we see a curve? We brace. <laughs> we grab on the side. Oh, the corn. Okay, then we, we turn. Both <laughs> ways turn. <laughs> For more information about painting and travel with Roger and Sarah Bansimer, visit paintingandtravel.com.